possible method in which we could present that to you tonight. Uh, from the looks of what I saw at the tail end of this, it was a nice, clear image. Uh, a great black and white photography uh, from uh, 1942. Uh, have a couple of really uh, outstanding guests here uh, that will follow up on uh, uh, what uh, uh, was sent to you early on. Uh, Noah Eisenberg is the author of a book that goes into a great detail about uh, the making of the film and uh, uh, how the movie uh, uh, existed uh, since uh, it was first released and continues to be uh, uh, an item that people will indeed come out and continue to uh, pay to see over and over again. Uh, no, uh, my, my question to you is kind of a follow-up as to what uh, you uh, uh, started to talk about um, earlier. And uh, I'll, I'll wait for a second. We'll introduce. Here I am. Hi. Leslie Epstein, folks. Uh, <laughs> he is, uh, Half of my father and uncle. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, the, uh, the son of one of the uh, uh, screenwriters. And uh, I'm, I'm sure these two gentlemen. I, I, I don't. I feel kind of like I'm not necessary here. I hand the microphones to these guys, and uh, they both have the gift of gab. I have found in, in the past uh, hour or so. And uh, I'm going to feel like that was the title of one of the screenplays that Leslie's father, father wrote. <laughs> <laughs> Philip G. Epstein, Gift of Gab, 1941. <laughs> So Julie, as he was called, Julius had arrived at Warner Brothers soon after graduating from Penn State, and uh, his first uh, picture that he wrote, he filled in for uh, Jerry Wald to complete a screenplay that Jerry Wald was struggling to, to write, isn't, isn't that correct? I think it's soon after he arrived in Hollywood. And then Philip Epstein, so Leslie can speak much more authoritatively to this, it's his father after all, but one of his early pictures came aptly enough under the title of The Gift of Gab. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were both known for their wit, for writing what was at the time known as champagne comedy, that bubbly effervescent stuff. Um, and yes, together, the two of them with, with Howard Koch, they are the ones who picked up the Oscar for Best Adapted Screenplay uh, from the slate of pictures that was released in 1943. Gen it was when the picture went to general release, 1943. Um, there's plenty that we can talk about. I'm sure that you're going to have lots and lots of questions, no doubt, as you Casablanca devotees in inevitably do. Um, but maybe you could talk a bit about your father and your uncle, because that's something very, very special. And having you here, in addition to having this little statuette, uh, is, is really quite extraordinary. And so I'm sure they'd love to hear from you, Leslie. State. They were tremendous. Uh, they loved Penn State and their experience. And they're both on the boxing team. My uncle Julie was an intercollegiate bat bantamweight champion oh. at Penn State. Uh, they couldn't get a job in the Depression, uh, but they had a, fr a fraternity brother, uh, Jerry Wald, who <coughs> said, "Come out to Julie. Come out to Hollywood." And uh, Julie went. And his education in films was, Jerry took him to a movie, he said, that's a long shot, that's a medium shot, that's a close up, that is <laughs> entire education in films. And Julie moved out into the valley and wrote a treatment, which is a brief 20 page sort of outline of a screenplay, original screenplay, every night, hand it in. And if you, you know the, the novel, What Makes Sammy Run, by Bud Schulberg, well, Julie is the Julian in that book. And Sammy is basically Jerry Wald, Jerry Wald yeah. and a few others, but basically Jerry Wald. And Jerry Wald would be at Warner Brothers, and he'd say, oh, we're having problems with the script. Let's break for lunch. He would race out to the valley. Julie would hand him 10 pages. He would run back to Warner Brothers. And uh, they 
they'd say, oh, Jerry, you're a genius. <laughs> and um, that went on for a year or two until Julie put his foot down and said, that's the end of this. I insist on getting credit. And I think his first credit was Living on Velvet, which as you can see, Turner Classic Movies has them all. Right? So you can see that movie there. Meanwhile, my father, Philip, had moved out to RKO. I think he did Gift of Gab at RKO. That, that sounds about right. Uh, at that point in time, I believe that Julie had the first of his two seven-year writing contracts at Warner's, but I think you're right. I think that Philip began at RKO. And, and then from RKO, they went to Warner Brothers together, uh, where they drove Jack Warner crazy for <laughs> 15 years or so until my father died uh, quite young. Uh, but they did together at Warner Brothers, Arsenic and Old Lace, uh, Man Who Came to Dinner. They really did a lot of uh, Yankee Doom Bandy, for which they now get credit. My father did 16 scenes in uh, Big Sleep. So there's a whole series of movies uh, that they did together. And after my father's death, Julie went on to do a lot of distinguished films uh, on his own, ending with Ruben Rubin, for which he got a nomination for an Academy Award. He got three nominations. I think he may be the only person, or at least screenwriter, who got three Academy Award nominations over such a long period of time. The first was for Four Daughters mm -hmm. with John Garfield. You could see that on Turner Classic Movies, too. And then for Casablanca, and they won for that. And then for Ruben Rubin, so over, over <coughs> 50 years or so, yeah. Yeah. he got, a, his career was alive and active and, and wonderful and recognized by the industry. Claude Rains was, was, was nominated, I think it's four times for Best Supporting, but he never had the Epstein luck. He never, he never actually picked up the award. He, he was nominated. Though he deserved it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I heard everyone laughing, of course, at <laughs> Claude Rains' lines at the end. Michael Curtis, who directed Casablanca, did get it yeah. uh, for Casablanca. When he went up, he had very fractured English. And what did he say? He said, uh, 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 always a bridegroom, but never a bride. <laughs> yeah, that's <a> good <laughs> uh, Yes, he was, he was also the one who, when, when Ingrid Bergman, who was struggling with this, this, uh, this role of Ilsa Lund, she wasn't sure whom it was she was to board that 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 clipper to 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 America. Actually, in this case, it was to Lisbon and then onward to America. But she kept asking, "Who am I to be in love with? Who am I to direct my amorous gaze at?" And, and my critics responded, "Don't worry, play it in between. <laughs> Just play it in between." And uh, in between, she played it, and that's actually what brought so much of the complexity to this bittersweet romance oh. is that she, throughout the production, was often just confused. She didn't know. Um, if you, you've heard stories, I'm sure, about the ending of Casablanca and how there was no ending. And as Noah has said, there was no ending. And, and uh, Ingrid Bergman was pulling her hair out, and Jack Warner was pulling what was left of his, his hair out. <laughs> And uh, the true story is that Julie and Phil, who are identical twins, and Julie has said, we thought as one person, I don't know which line I wrote, and I don't know which line Phil wrote. They were driving down, if any of you are from Los Angeles, you will know this, Sunset Boulevard in Beverly Glen. At the red light, they stopped and they turned to each other and said, round up the usual suspects. Just simultaneously. And as they continued east on sunset, by the time they got to Doheny, they said, well, Strasbourg's going to be shot. And, and they, by the time they got to Burbank, they had the entire ending worked out in the nick of time. Wow. Yeah, and it was, it was that line. I, uh, as you can imagine, I'm deep in the triple digits on watching this movie. But it's that line that I heard when walking. Everybody, of course, is in stitches with Wound Up the Usual Suspects. And it's such an absolutely wonderful, one of the most memorable lines in the history of motion pictures. Um, when it comes to that final line, though, that, that, that was how Wallace, who, who, who yes, supplied another one of the greatest all-time lines 
times in the history of motion pictures. Louis, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Uh, and there was a line in the script that I suspect your father and uncle provided. Howard Koch could have had a, had a hand in this one, I'm not sure. But Louis, I thought you might mix a little patriotism with lar a little larceny with patriotism or something like that. And it was Hal Wallace who had the good sense to replace it with uh, Louis. I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. As for the pulling of the gun, and I'm sure that was your father and uncle who helped to give not only the lines but the stage directs and everything, but it was the, the, the uh, production code administration, so the Hayes Code, that determined that Strasser, that Conrad Veidt, had to have his gun pulled before Rick shot it, because otherwise he would have shot him in cold blood, and that would not have passed the censorship board. And it was better that way. It was, absolutely. But Conrad Veidt had to pull it. Now, Conrad Veidt, I, I, in, in, in my, <laughs> what I claim to be short introduction, short for an academic, I qualify it. It was very short for an academic. Um, Conrad Veidt was one of these. He was not a refugee the way that some of these big players, these day players, were refugees. But he, too, had fled the Nazi regime. He was married to a Jewish woman named Lily Prague, who was a stage actress from Budapest. And when the Nazis came to power, he was asked to supply the uh, certificate and the, 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 the various information that they required of all the actors, including religion. So your background, your religion. And Conrad Veidt wrote in block letters under his religion, he wrote, you did, Jew. He wasn't Jewish. But his uh, very, very deep anti-Nazi inclination, his sentiment, his commitment, was already there in January of 33. And he and his wife, Lili Praga, they migrated soon after. And so many, just to <coughs> pick up a little bit on some of the things that I was saying, so many of these, of these, of these actors involved in crime. I mentioned Michael Curtiz. Curtiz had directed already at this point over 60 films. Uh, this is, I think, his 63rd, 64th, 65th, it doesn't matter. Um, but he was known for his extraordinary efficiency, his Poor command of the English language as well. And yes, there was Peter Lorre, who was another one of these refugees. Peter Lorre had come to Hollywood already in 34. He fled because uh, he, he claimed after, after the rise of Nazism that there wasn't enough room in, in Nazi Germany for Hitler and himself because he was a child murderer in M and, and was at that point already the way that Marcel Dalio was in, in Vichy, France. He was made sort of the poster poster to Marcel Dalio's face was printed on, on placards in, in Vichy, France as well for the sort of the, the poster child you, of the, you, of the you Jew. Should, you should be aware of Marcel Dalio. He's one of the world's great actors. He just dis briefly appears and then disappears in this film. He's the croupier in the film. He says, you're winning, sir. And the oh, shoes all fade, right? Yeah. right? But he was in, in my opinion, and we've discussed this, right. Maybe the greatest film ever made by, by Jean Renoir, which is Rules of the Game. He, he, he was a great actor in that film, central role in that film, and also in Grand Illusion, which I think so. So he was a great, great actor. And he too was married to uh, a woman who appeared in the play, Madeleine Lebeau, who, play, who of course, in the Marseillaise, uh -huh. play, and the tears are coming down, one of the great moments in all of film history, I think. The, the sad part of it is they got divorced in the middle of the movie. Uh, <laughs> Claims of desertion. But, the, but, but interestingly, too, though, just in terms of understanding how much this story of Casablanca meant to those people who were performing on screen, Madeleine Lebeau, who was all of 19 during the production, and Marcel Dalio, who was born Israel Moshe Blauschi in Romania, but had come of age theatrically, politically, and otherwise in France, and performing in two of these great Jean Renoir pictures, Rules of the Game and Grand Illusion, on the eve of the Nazis marching into Paris, they managed to flee the French capital from Marseille and onward then to Lisbon. With forged visas, they boarded a Portuguese freighter for Mexico. They arrived in Mexico, and with Canadian visas, somehow they managed to cross the border into California ultimately making their way to Burbank, California. Um, Madeleine LeBeau, whom Leslie mentioned, she, 
singing the perhaps the greatest of all scenes in the picture is one of your favorites, I know. But the, the Marseillaise scene, when those tears are streaming down your cheek, those are real tears. And everyone else was crying. And the entire, and, and, and it's Dan Seymour who plays Abdul the Doorman. He's one of the few American-born players, and he was just a bit player, but uh, he was one of the few. He said he knew because they were speaking foreign language, speaking French, they were speaking German, in some cases Czech, Romanian, uh, uh, Hungarian, and so forth. He said he knew, but at that moment when he saw the tears streaming down the cheeks, he realized these were all real refugees, uh, and he was floored by that. In the nine-minute flashback in the film, nowhere to be found in the three-act stage play written by Murray Burnett and Joan Ellis, and everybody comes to Rick's. Casey Robinson has apparently had a hand in, in crafting these nine minutes of screen time. But there was when they're shooting out in the outdoor cafe. shooting it, and one of the extras in the, in, the, in the midst of shooting it becomes absolutely inconsolable. She just, she's, she's, she's shrieking, and it's, it's, it's awful, and, 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 and Michael Curtiz with his rocketing has become very, very frustrated. And a small man with a beard marches over to, 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 to Mr. Curtiz. Mr. Curtiz, Mr. Curtiz, I'm so terribly, terribly sorry. You see, that is my wife. We were in Paris the day it was reliving that trauma. And so the point of telling you that, again, admittedly relatively long-winded anecdote, is that so many of these players, so actually, and in fact, not just the players, so on both sides of the camera, had a stake in the story that was being told and the story that Marie Burnett had witnessed in that fateful summer of 1938. Um, and so it wasn't, and this is even, you know, Pauline Kael, who was the great film critic for The New Yorker for so many years, and didn't have terribly nice things to say about this movie. She thought it was, in her so, words... So she wasn't so great. Hey, well, <laughs> sh sh schlocky romanticism was her phrase. Schlocky romanticism. What she did say, however, late in life, when she was interviewed by Aldrin Hartnett, who did a, a great production history of the film in 1992, for the 50th anniversary called Round Up. Pauline Kael told Algene Hermit, she said, were it not for this deep cast of refugees and all of their authentic accents, it would not have that kind of, you know, that, 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 that patina of, 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 of truth, authenticity. of authenticity, that it clearly has. Otherwise, it would just be another Hollywood studio confection. Let me give some credit to my, the enemy of my father and uncle, Jack Warner. Hollywood behaved disgracefully through the 30s when Germany came to power. They, Germany was the second largest source of income for the studios after England abroad. And they did everything they could to placate Hitler and Goebbels, who ran the film industry there. They fired all their Jewish employees. Now, Paramount was the worst of all. They stayed there, they stayed, some of them stayed there till night, till Pearl Harbor. The only studio that took a stand was Warner Brothers. And they pulled out, I think in 1934, right. very so, early. Um, and Jack Warner made the only films in, that, in the 30s that just openly attacked the rise of Nazism, Confessions of a Nazi Spy. Keep, keep watching Turner Classic movies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can see them all. And uh, some of the people in that movie were also in, yeah. in Casablanca. So Jack Warner was a son of a bitch in a lot of ways. But he had more courage than his colleagues in the film industry over this most important topic. And I do give him credit for that. So promptly Groucho Marx in, in 1938 to come as the only studio in Hollywood with any guts, is what he said. And as a result, they were accused of being premature anti-fascist. That was the term of the day. <laughs> and Harry Warner, who was the moral voice of, of, of Warner Brothers, was called in before Congress to testify. Uh, it was that very, very vocal 
isolationist, nativist faction within Congress that brought him in. Called America First. Yes, exactly. <laughs> that brought him in because they claimed that, they, that Warner Brothers were beating the drums of war. Um, and you have to give credit to Warner Brothers for being one of the earliest studios to yeah, have a moral backbone. About, about Julian Phillips. Please do. So, in 1946, I think it was, yeah. just before the McCarthyite period, there was a House and American Activities Committee, and they were holding hearings on Hollywood. Uh, Rankin and other Republican uh, congressmen. And uh, Jack Warner named everybody he had a contract to speak with. <laughs> as a, and they named Julian Phil. And uh, why? He says, oh, they're un-American. They're always on the side of the underdog. <laughs> that was his, his explanation. So Julian Phil got a, a subpoena from the uh, House and American UAC, House and American Activities Committee, and this commi uh, the pre-subpoena document had two parts. It said, "Are you now, or have you ever been a member of a subversive organization?" Part A. Part B was, "If so, name that organization." So Julian Phil filled out the subpoena. He says, have you ever been a member of a subversive organization? They said, yes. He said, Name that organization. They put down Warner Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> and then they never heard from the committee again. <laughs> Tom Doherty, we were at Brandeis a, a, a month ago, and Tom Doherty was a very, very distinguished senior film historian on the faculty there. He's doing a book on the HUAC. Uh, years, the McCarthy years, and he dug up, thanks to the Freedom of Information Act, he dug up that file, I think it was Julie's file, was it? it was Julie or Phil's file, I can't remember, but in that file, what you have, the, 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 the proof of their subversive activities is the sympathetic portrayal of Dooley Wilson as Sam. Mm. The Daily Worker, which was the organ of the American Communist Party, the film critic David Platt had written in his review of 1943 that the, 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 the picture shows the African Americans, before the term exists, Negro actor, Arthur Dooley Wilson, in a positive light, and that that should be a cause for celebration and praise. Something that the Amsterdam News, the black owned newspaper in Harlem, they wrote as well. You've got to all go out, as the critic wrote, you must see Casablanca because of Dooley Wilson's performance here. He's not a Pullman porter, he's not a domestic, he's not a shoeshine boy. He has complexity, he's a fully formed character. And that's what caused the, the, uh, the, the FBI to keep a file in. Yeah, yeah time, for, time for questions, we've told our stories. Yeah, the question I have is, <clears throat> the original screenplay was, I should say, a three act play, everybody goes to Rex Hoop. How far into the movie does that screenplay carry? Um, you know, because I said in the end of the movie, nobody knew how it ended, so obviously that was added on to the original screenplay. The screenplay goes to, how, how big is that, I guess, as, as a subset of the, move, of the movie? Well, the funny thing here is that in the three-act stage play by Marie Burnett and Joan Allison, Laszlo boards the plane with Lois Meredith. She's American. This is, the, this is uh, uh, Ilza Lund's far more libertine American doppelganger. But that's what becomes those a look. Um, and so you have it there, and then Rick Blaine is whisked off with the Nazi, with the, the, the Nazi entourage, which would not have, the two dueling censorship bodies, I mentioned the Hayes Code before, the Production Code Ministry, the other was the Office of War Information. Mm -hmm. And these films had to support the Allied war effort. To be whisked off by Strasser at the end, that would not have, have passed. But it was clear already then, and so after, you know, this is part, and I think that you, your uncle too, pe people told stories about this, and I'm not suggesting that they were necessarily false stories, but they, as family tales tend to do, they gained a certain amount of traction and people retold them, and Bergman as well, she claimed throughout the whole production she didn't know, but in this three-act stage play, it's pretty clear. Rick is staying, Laszlo's going, and, and uh, Lois Meredith, who becomes the Nils Lund, is also going on that plane. The lines weren't fully written, and the lines are definitely attributable to your, to your, to your uncle and your father. 
but it was relatively clear. That said, pages were being delivered on set throughout the production, yeah. and there are plenty of eyewitnesses yeah. that, 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 that give testimony to that effect. What's the film? Carrot Blanket, it's the Bugs Bunny Carrot. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Wait a second, we're not talking a feature. So we're talking uh, <laughs> in, their, in, in their animation yeah. uh, unit, Carrot Blanket, yeah, with, Blanket. With, yeah, with Bugs Bunny. Yeah, right. Yes, then, doing bogey. Right, and then yes. I also noticed from... Carrot Blanca, it's called. Sorry. Yes. It's my upstate New York. That's okay. <laughs> um, the, another movie that involved the Nazis, Come to the sing along this summer. We learn these things. Okay. <laughs> I've got my Edelweiss, don't you worry. <laughs> this is a question Is it true that in order to make the planes look bigger in the background, uh, they use special little effects or special yeah. people in this case? Yes. Uh, it is true. Then. Yes, huh? it is very true. For that effect in the final scene, that's all done on the Warner sound stages that are on the back lot. The first shot when Strasser's plane arrives, that's the Van Nuys Airport. And they're now in the process, just of last week, I, I got a report, they're going to save it, they're going to bring it back, which would be fantastic. Such a great piece of cultural history. But the, the, the one at the end, where we see Laszlo runs off, and you get a few glimpses of the people sort of getting the plane together and whatnot, those were, I mean, they could have been extras from The Wizard of Oz, I'm not right. sure. Yeah. But those were little people. Little people. Right. That's true. It's okay, Rick Blaine in the back. Go ahead, go for it. Um, the, it the original st uh, stage show. Yes. Uh, is, would that, is that still around? Is that still yeah. Being Wesleyan, Wesleyan owns a copy of it. And, and uh, yeah, everybody comes to Rick's? Yeah. Yes. And would the, would the film version ever be adapted to a stage show? I mean, obviously not with all the, the plane effects or anything, but could that ever be adapted or? It, they've attempted in many instances. There's, there was a, there was an all woman troupe in, in in Japan that does that does a Casablanca. Yes, there was a ballet in Beijing. There, I read the book. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, no, no. There was also a radio play. There was a radio play that 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 Murray Burnett, who was the original playwright, he had handed, and that that starred. Uh, Marlena Dietrich performing a kind of Rick, as she loved to do drag, but a kind of Rick Blaine character in that called Cafe, Cafe Istanbul, I think was the name of it. Yeah. I, I'd always heard Cafe that uh, your dad and your uncle had changed the story quite a lot. And then a few months ago, I read a story that actually the plot wasn't altered that much. Obviously, they brought all those charms to the dialogue and everything, but I was curious about that. In terms of actual plot instances, uh, uh, transformation scenes, is, is it pretty close to what the original version uh, original play that was? That was a question that was asked before. Do you? Yeah, absolutely, and I think that's where the Howard Koch got into trouble because he claimed that the, 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 the three act stage play when it comes to it supplied nothing but the exotic locale oh, okay. and the character of Rick. I think it was, or, or something basically. Something as 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 as, as, as minuscule as, as that. Sure. It turns out it provided far more. But you're absolutely right, and I think you're giving good credit because in terms of the dialogue, especially in terms of the wit, oh, okay. that is very much, I think, attributable to the Epstein twins. Um, but <laughs> and I'm not just saying that to pander to dear Leslie here. I think it's the absolute truth, and if you look at their other work, you see it. You can you know just as the way that the French auteurist critics would look for the signature style of a director, you can see it here in the writers, and you can see kind of recurrent motifs and just the way that the, uh, the, the snappiness of the, of the dialogue and so forth. Not, um, not just the dialogue, because, you know, the, this film is taught <coughs> McGee, right? Is yeah. He, oh, yeah, yeah, it's Robert McGee. Yeah, if you've seen the film adaptation, they talk about the Epstein brothers and, and uh, McGee's course, and, and that's the preeminent yeah. screenwriting course and uh, collegiate course in the country. 
and Casablanca is taught there as not just an example of dialogue, but yeah. structure. Yeah. And how a plot mm -hmm. is structured. Yeah. I think his term, he often talks about plot points. I think that's the, the Robert plot McKee, points. yeah, plot points. Um, so, yes, I mean, the bones are there, but it's what they do with it that makes it, I think, so extraordinary. I think, I think it's the second highest rated, you know, the screenplay in the, or even American film in the yeah. country. And the first one is, is uh, Citizen Kane. <laughs> Forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was always uh, Roger Ebert who was asked, he says, what do you regard to be the greatest picture in the history of motion picture, specifically speaking of America? He says, is it Citizen Kane? Says, What's the film that you like watching most? Is Casablanca. <laughs> so what is it that gives you the most pleasure? Casablanca. Um, but yes, and then in the screen romances, it's always vying for the top slot with Gone with the Wind. And, but anyway, well, it depends how much stock you invest in these sort of polls. But don't you There's think, I mean, here you're watching it in 2017. Uh, and I never watch it anymore. I came in right yeah, round up the usual suspects. I, I came in the door. But, I mean, doesn't it hold up well oh, yeah. 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 over all these years? You know, it's still the same old story. <laughs> <laughs> the other question I had, I heard, uh, I just caught sort of a piece of, uh, on NPR, they were talking about the, the 75th anniversary. And it, the one thing that surprised me was, and I never would have expected this, but I think it was the highest paid cast member was Paul Heinrich. He was, uh, like, Humphrey Bogart wasn't, like... Uh, Paul Heinrich. Yeah. yeah. Paul Heinrich, he... Bogart was like the second or third. Yeah, Conrad Veidt commanded a very high salary yeah. as well from MGN. Yeah, and Bogart when it wrapped, Bogie became the highest paid actor in, 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 in the world. Mm. But after it wrapped, after he suddenly realized, oh my God, I can do this. I am a romantic lead. <laughs> because he's wearing platform shoes when he's dancing to Perfidia with Bergman because of the height differential. And he was terrified about suddenly being cast as this romantic lead. He didn't think he could do it. Sam Jaffe's agent thought he could. Jack Warner said, who, the, who, who in the right mind would ever want to kiss Bogey? Um, and, and Jack Warner, who was, I think it was Jack Benny, said, would rather tell a bad joke than make a good picture. Um, <laughs> but what was Paul uh, Heinrich's claim to fame that he was so highly paid? Uh, he, 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 now Voyager, was that after? Now Voyager was just before. That was the first of now, the, now of the Hal Wallace uh, signature uh, uh, pictures for, for Warners. And what about Inger Bergman? Was she cast-wise? Oh, uh, boy. David O. Selznick collected a lot of money on that loan out. So he, he, he held her contract. He got Olivia de Havilland on that, on that trade there and took, I think, a hundred plus thousand dollars to her 25, I think it was 25 or 35 thousand dollars. So David O. Selznick did great on that, mm -hmm. on that. Uh, Ingrid Bergman, not so much. Speaking and she regretted that she was forever always recognized only for this picture. She did, to her mind, so many better films as she thought, but she was, oh, 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 everybody only wanted to talk about Casablanca. Well, oh, she's so beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Um, speaking of money, I'll <laughs> settle the Howard Koch issue. Uh, Julie and Phil were paid thirty-five thousand right, right. dollars, and he was paid five, I think. Uh, maybe t a tad more, but not much. Yeah. It couldn't have been more than seven. Yeah. So you know, they knew what they were. And that was on. That, that's the amount of time that you spent writing. Yeah. So they knew what they were writing for. There's a hand here, and then maybe we should break. But go ahead. Leslie, do you know what inspired your father and uncle to to be writers? Was there a particular movie or or writer? They did journalism at Penn State, and uh, then they did theater. My father was a back end of a, of a, of a horse <laughs> in, in New York. Uh, they were publicists. Remember Fatty Arbuckle? Uh, until his tragedy, they were publicists for him. So they were on the fringes of this all the time. But it was that call from Jerry Wall that said, come out, and I'll teach you films. And they said, one afternoon, he got his whole film education course. So much for film schools. Yeah. And I think Ju Julie at Penn State already had also knocked out a, a, about a handful of, of plays that he, that he said were just total crap, but that he, he managed to write, I think, while he was still a student at Penn State. He, that, that, he said that in that interview in, uh, with Patrick McGilligan, I think oh. it is a story, yeah. Backstory. Backstory, sorry. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Story, okay. backstory. Noah. Wait, yes, wait, Jimmy, you have the, a the one. New Hampshire story that I noticed in there was an anecdote about Peter Laurie, 
Oh, can you tell that? That's right. Yeah, Peter Lorre, ever the prankster. So you mentioned uh, Curtis was, was was also known for his afternoon trysts with uh, various aspiring starlets on the set. And, and on, the, on the set. Peter Lorre, this did, I'll get to the New Hampshire one just a bit, but I have to sort of, this is going to be yeah. my lead up to it. Okay. Is he got the sound guys to rig Michael Curtiz's trailer so that when he went in for his little afternoon, <laughs> you could hear it throughout the entire Burbank studio. <laughs> yeah, Peter Lorre also used to, he, he, he used, an, uh, there's an eye drop. He would go around and every time that Michael Curtiz would put down a cigarette, Peter Lorre would go through a little eye drop filled with water and put it out. <laughs> but he was staying here, it was in the Whites, Mountains. I guess. It must have been in the White Mountains. And um, he learned, as was not terribly uncommon at the time, there was a sign that was up that said that the, that the, that the, the hotel would not allow Jews to stay there. And Paul Henry, when he was in Miami, stayed at a place that said, no Jews are dogs. And, and Paul Henry was not Jewish, but he was deeply offended. He couldn't believe after fleeing the Nazis. But he loved dogs. Yeah, right. Exactly, right exactly. <laughs> there you go. But um, but we've been rehearsing this one, by the way. <laughs> and Peter Lorre, inveterate prankster, storms out of the hotel. He spills the ink blotter, I think, in the, in the reception. And then for two or three years gets them a subscription to the Jewish Daily Forward. <laughs> <laughs> so that's Peter Lorre for you. Born Laszlo Lewenstein uh, in Hungary and, and, and raised in Vienna. And then I had a question for Leslie. <clears throat> You've loaned us the wonderful Oscar. How many are there? How many were given? Did the twins each get one? Yes, they, uh, and so did Howard Koch. There's another story. I mean, he sold his. Oh, God. Oh. He sold his for a lot of money. He said, i got to put my grandchildren through college. But, I mean, you know, I would never sell, <laughs> sell this. Each one got an Oscar. There was a Bel Air fire in 1961 and destroyed Julie's house. And his Oscar was just a puddle of uh, uh, gold-colored metal. And so he got another a replica, but it's this. This one is um, 1942. You saw how heavy it was, much heavier than the ones now, <coughs> much more beautiful than the ones now. I think, mm -hmm. which are too glossy and gold. Um, These were wartime measures, I think. Yeah, wartime. Yeah. They didn't have the materials then, so they had better materials. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. I think. And so they each got um, their own Oscar, and this is the one for Philip. I'm, I'm the last one to defend Howard Koch because I think that what he told late in life was kind of reprehensible about wanting to take far too much credit than, than, than the record allows. In terms of selling it, I suspect he was blacklisted for a number of years and had to flee to, to he was in London and, and, and spent, spent uh, quite a few years. But I wonder whether he also, it was just purely that he'd, he'd gone belly up, I don't know. It's, it's pure speculation, I don't write anything about that in the book. But I don't know whether he sold it also just because he, he'd run out, uh, spending those years in exile. You defend him. No. <laughs> I, I, I remember the last one to defend him because, yes, when he, when he made those claims, when he published that book and wrote that foreword in which he basically claimed not only that the Epstein twins had very little to do with this, but that the, the, the stage play, which supplied so much of this film, which he then later, in the Los Angeles Times in 19, I think it's 1991, he wrote this letter to the editor in which he admitted that he'd been wrong. And I was at the at the fiftieth anniversary mm -hmm. of Casablanca. I was at Lincoln yeah, Center, yeah. and Howard Koch walked up the aisle, and Julie stood up in front of him and put out his hand because Howard Koch was actually a nice man. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he, and he, let's put all this behind us, Howard. Julie said, and, and Howard Koch apologized for for we all make mistakes. Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. On that positive note, <laughs> redemption. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you as well. Thanks for coming, folks. Books. 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 If you're not.